is the 24th of August 2022 and it's the day when Angolans over 14 million of the registered voters in the country will choose the next parliament and most especially their next president. Now the capital city Luanda has been plastered by political propaganda for days, weeks and running into months. Now this is a day where the uh, Angolans will choose their leader and we see in what people have speculated that it is going to be the tightest elections after uh, you know the multi-party system was introduced in 1975 after the country got its independence. So today we're here to give you the update on the elections. That's right. So if you are tuning in, thank you so much for staying with us. We'll be taking you through for the next two or three hours or thereabout. And of course, uh, around the clock as we bring to you bit by bit and of course, blow by blow account on what is happening down there in Angola. We will be having guests join us. And without further ado, let's go straight into what's happening as we will be showing you footage and of course, uh, more information uh, concerning the ongoing elections, uh, as you can see there uh, on the screen. further we do have our um, guests also joining us uh, to discuss further we do have our guests who are here live we do have political analysts all the way from Luanda Angola Claudio Silva joins us thank you so much for being here Claudio thank you it's a pleasure to be here again thank you Claudio also we do have uh, Francisco uh, Capalo Ngongo who definitely is a political economy analyst and also international consultant all the way from Luanda, Angola. Thank you for joining us too. Thank you very much for having me. All right, so let's start off as we begin uh, with a, a view and a quicker look at what the happening uh, is like, especially out there in Angola. First of all, uh, tell us, what's the atmosphere like? Are people going to work or is there no work? And um, uh, what is everyone doing at the moment, especially uh, around you? I'll start with you, Francisco. Yeah, so if, no, sorry. Go, go, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, today is a bank holiday, so no one is going to, to work. So everyone must go to vote. So it's the day, uh, it's a very special day for uh, Angolan people because uh, as uh, many commentators are saying, is, uh, this election will be highly competitive and also controversial. So everyone want to, to the government decreed to be a, a bank holiday so that people can vote and wait for the result. So as uh, for the mood, it's still um, a good mood for this morning. Uh, people, it's quite, full, uh, it's quite and peaceful. Uh, morning, so we we are waiting uh, maybe afternoon to see what we, will happen. So we are all at home and uh, going to vote, and then waiting at home or oh, five five hundred meters be, uh, 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 to the to, from the the polling station. Mm. That's a, that's that's a good one. All right, let, let's let's listen to you, Claudio. Claudio, um, what is it like in your area? Yeah, I went to vote today at uh, around seven o'clock. Polls were supposed to open at seven, but in my particular polling station, we had a one-hour delay. Uh, people were starting to get a little bit frustrated and exasperated. Um, my my polling station was a bit more disorganized than than others I've seen. Uh, but like, like just like Francisco said, in general, this is there's a great mood in the streets. It's very peaceful. It's a cloudy day. It's not sunny at all. So people have nothing else to do today than than, than, than voting. The focus really is on is on voting. I've talked to a couple of friends in other areas of of Luanda, more more heavily populated areas, and they've told me that the turnout uh, has been has been pretty robust, especially among among young people and women. So it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting start to our election day. 
All right, now, Francisco, let's talk about the elections and the expectations of the people. Now, we know that uh, the elections and the government generally have been ruled by a ruling party that has been in power for over five decades. We're talking 47 years by the, um, you know, the leader, uh, Joao Lorenco. And we also know that there is a new first-time contender, and that's uh, Adalberto Costa Jr. Now, what do we say are the expectations of the people as regards the change? Now, I've seen the the uh, propaganda. And I've seen Adalberto talk about how you can't introduce change if you don't change the leadership. Also, Gio Lorenco has talked about he is the leader for change. So what do we say the people are expecting from these two parties? Um, the, expect the expectation is very high. It's very high. I can say there are two main re uh, reasons why people uh, seeing this election as uh, very different. Uh, saying we can't change the leader because the main problem in the in the part in the country is um, we have one party ruling the part in the country since the independence. So the, the, the people who are born in, in 19 after 1975 they never seen any party ruling. So uh, from young people who did not even experience war, so they want to see different because uh, the, the first issues, uh, first the majority of Angolan people, many young people, they are fed up with uh, the almost half century of uh, the MPLA regime and there's therefore a desire for change. The widespread poverty, corruption, uh, poor social services delivering health care is a problem in Angola. Election service, a, 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 a education is a very poor. Housing is very difficult to get a house, even to buy a plot. Although the law uh, say the land belong to the to the state, but there is no state institution that will be, will sell you the, the the land. So you need to buy it to the private and the government can demolish your house whenever they want. Unemployment is another issue. So that's why, according to the national and the international political analyst, Angolan people uh, want change, and they don't believe that this change will come from the MPLA. Uh, that that's give uh, a window of opportunity for the, 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 the main opposition party, UNITA, for this election, because many are saying that maybe that should be uh, the change we want. So it's not only the change of personnel in, 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 in the power, but the change of the, the regime. Because we, have, we, have, we live from the independence during the, war, uh, the, the 27 years of civil war, it was one party ruling, and then the introduction of a multi-party uh, system in 1992, the same party continue to be a dominant, uh, is still dominant in the parliament. So we have a parliament of 20, 20, uh, 220 seats and 150 are occupied by the ruling party, 51 by UNITA and 16, uh, 16 for, uh, with another opposition party, Kazase, uh, uh, two for Perez and one for um, FNLE. So this is not healthy in terms of uh, policy making, in terms of law, uh, lawmaker, because all the, the, the law are dominated by, uh, by the ruling party. It's the ruling party that is def deciding the, 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 how the country can be ruled, and the voice of people never been heard. So that's why the mood for many young people who are uh, the, the, the main supporter of opposition party. They want to see this change, not change of the personnel in power, like it was from Dos Santos to Lorenzo, but change from the ruling party, MPLA, to another party. And the, that's party that the, the biggest or the major opposition party is UNITA. All right, thank you, Francisco. Now, Claudio, let me bring you back in. Francisco has touched on a very key aspect, and that's the economy. Now, let's talk about the uh, Angola's indebtedness to China. We know that there is a long-standing history between both countries where China financed Angola to some extent, and uh, I'm talking about, I think, $60 billion, if I'm not mistaken. And Angola agreed that they are going to 
uh, provide China with oil. We know that that is Africa's second largest oil producer. But then we see that China dominated that market. And that's one of the complaints that the Ute in Angola are having till date. We see that Chinese people are introducing their own businesses. And then uh, the, the, most, the majority of Angolan Ute are jobless. And that's because they don't have uh, you know the access to produce these things to to work with the oil uh, you know refineries and produce the oil for chinese people the chinese people are exporting the oil and bringing in their people to work there as well so what do we say about this uh, contrasting figure we see that the youth in angola are uh, suffering unemployment and we, it's also contrasting because we know that that is like one of the biggest oil producing countries so what do you say about that claudio Angola turned to the Chinese government after the end of the Civil War to help it reconstruct the country. So the country was in complete shambles. Uh, the international community was, uh, was saying that they wanted to help Angola, but with what was perceived as strings attached. And those strings were implementation of rule of law, um, a deepening of democracy, respect for human rights. When the Angolan government looked at the Chinese, the Chinese said, we don't really care about these things. We're not going to meddle in your internal affairs as China uh, is known to do. We are just going to supply you with the financing you need in return for the natural resource we need. And that is exactly what happened. Over the next decade and a half, the Chinese invested, as you, as you rightly mentioned, over, uh, about $60 billion in a variety of different loans to the Angolan government. And, and the, Angolan, the Angolan state became uh, for a while, the biggest oil supplier, the biggest supplier of crude oil uh, to China, even surpassing uh, Saudi Arabia. However, unfortunately, this investment, or should I say this uh, assistance, these loans, came with their own strings attached, not re re democracy or rule of law uh, or, or, or separation between party and state, but rather uh, Chinese nationals had to be, had to be employed for these mega infrastructure projects. Chinese companies have to be uh, contracted for these massive infrastructure projects. And that, what does that mean for the population? It means that the Angolan youth and the Angolan population did not directly contribute to actually building the new roads, the new railroads, the new housing development. Um, these were done by Chinese nationals. And once this, that burden became too much, and once, once the price of oil decreased, and once the uh, political uh, influence of the Chinese decreased here in, here in Angola, you saw that the number of Chinese companies and the number of Chinese nationals in the country has also plummeted. Uh, at one point, I believe we had around 250,000 Chinese people living here in Angola, living and working. And now that number has dropped to less than a quarter of that, so less than, less than um, about 50,000 people, Chinese people living in the country. And not only did, did economic factors contribute to a lessening of, of Angola's dependence on China, but also this dependence was beset by massive corruption scandals. Uh, there was a famous Chinese national called Sam Pa. He went by many different names. And he was part, or rather the head of, of, of a conglomerate of companies called the Queensway, uh, the Queensway Group that was involved in, in massive corruption Scandals, not just here in Angola, but also in Guinea uh, and, and other African states where there was a, a strange uh, relationship between Sampa, his group of companies, the Chinese state, and then the, the, the various African states that they operated in. And they were able to siphon off these deals, billions of U.S. dollars. So now we're in two, 2022. You look at what was done with these $60 billion of Chinese uh, investment and loans into Angola, and sometimes it's difficult to find a, a concrete answer. Yes, you see that actual buildings were built. You see that roads were built, that railroads were built, but the roads had to be rebuilt, some of them twice after the Chinese did, uh, did, did, the, uh, did the, the initial uh, outlay of war because the quality was so poor. Railroads have constant uh, accidents because the work was poorly done. And this isn't to say that the Chinese are to blame here. Uh, their ambassador recently said that he, here in Luanda that the, the quality of their roads and the quality of the work 
was based on what was expected of them and what was paid to them by the Angolan state. So he's implicitly blaming the Angolan state for the poor quality of, of, the, of the infrastructure that they left behind. So as, as, a, as a population, money does not grow on trees and it doesn't fall from the sky. You look at the money, uh, the amount of money that was outlaid for these massive infrastructure projects it's that five years or 10 years later, we have to reinvest in, and it is a massive waste, taking into account all the, 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 the basic services and infrastructure that a population needs. And, and Francisco actually brought up a really good point um, earlier in our conversation about, about people, uh, young and old, eating from, from trash bins here in, in the capital city of Luanda. This is a, this is a city and, and a country that for a while was one of the highest growing economies in the world. And now you have a situation where it's like a small epidemic of, of people having their meals in trash cans, going to trash cans and, and trying to salvage whatever they can. And I actually saw one of these men on my way to my polling station today. Here I am, a 34-year-old and old male. I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to, to vote for, for some sort of change in this country. And there is some, there's a, a, another man, probably 20 years older than me, who's getting his meal from, from a trash can. It's just a jarring juxtaposition that, sadly, we have become all too used to uh, here, here in Angola. All right, Claudio. Um, I mean, we, we can go uh, on and on and on, but we're going to come back to that infrastructural conversation and, of course, that with China and Angola. But we just saw a footage uh, and you could tell that that was um, Adalberto Costa Jr., who was uh, cast... Uh, I, I mean, everybody uh, around there, uh, you can see the jubilation and so on and so forth. But uh, this brings to mind the question. Now, 60% of Angolans are indeed under 24 years. The youths make up a huge population. And it seems Adalberto's um, communicate with these youths and Angolans is that he's about to bring the change. Being uh, the, the agent for change, especially uh, in line with what the youths are seeking. Now, what are your thoughts about um, this structure of his that he's put forward? I'm going to go straight uh, to you first, uh, Francisco. Uh, yes, uh, I think the youth have... Uh... All right, I think we have a network issue. Let, let, me, let me pose that question back to you, Claudio. The Angolan elections are peculiar uh, because this is not a normal democratic state. Angola is an autocratic state that's transitioning into democracy. And the MPLA is used to being the only, the only party in power. It's been, uh, it's been almost 40 years, 47 years since independence, or 48 years since independence, that they are the only, the only game in town in terms of being used to having power. Although Berto's main message has been incredibly consistent since, since he came to power in UNITA, and, and obviously since, the, uh, since, the, since his campaign began in earnest, which is he wants to completely overhaul the state. He wants to restructure the state. He wants to do away with the remnants of one party rule. Uh, he wants to bring back direct presidential elections. Uh, he wants to amend the constitution to allow for that to happen. He wants to implement local elections and he wants to, to increase investment in health and education. And with that, he wants to contribute to a higher employment rate among the Angolan youth. And if you talk to, 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 to our youth, that's exactly what they want. This, this, is a, this isn't just an election between two men, but it's, it's an election between two different systems of government. One which seeks to consolidate power in its hands and to reward its most ardent supporters, and the other that is much more inclusive. And we saw this during this election campaign, uh, UNITA included in its list of uh, members of parliament leaders from other parties, even the MPLA, uh, MPLA dissidents, and people from civil society that are really good at what they do. They have different levels of expertise that Adalberto Costa Jr. wants to bring to the table. And that is why the support amongst Angola's youth has skyrocketed. Uh, it's it's, it's a, a sector of society that is most in need of basic services. It's a sector of society that, that has not or has no memory of civil war, is not involved in these Cold War tricks that we still see 
from the from the party in power. It, it's a it's a it's a a generation that's facing forward. They look around it. They look at Afri other African countries and the development that other African countries have, and they ask, "Why can't we have the same?" Especially considering that we keep hearing over and over again that we are a rich country, that we have all these oil reserves and we have all these diamonds. So why can't we see that in our day-to-day -day lives? And why are we unemployed? Meanwhile, why are, why are these people fabulously wealthy? Some of them even billionaires. So that's a question that that the Angolan youth have, and it seems that so far. Uh, the main candidate that has been able to address these concerns and offer uh, a viable alternatives has been the best question. And I think that goes some way into explaining his appeal amongst our youth. All right, thank you for that, Claudio. We've got Francisco back now, and so I'm going to throw my next question at him. Francisco, this election is a very tight one, and we've seen, even from speculations before now, that is a very, very keenly contested one between uh, Jao Lorenco and Adalberto, who has just voted, by the way. Now, if we look at the statistics and look at the the number of people who are gearing towards voting and the number of people who are actually campaigning for these people, could you give us a ballpark estimate of what the opinion poll is saying? Who do we think is leading at the moment? Uh, that is um, a difficult question to answer because uh, um, we don't have uh, a clear opinion poll um, some they are financed by political party to to produce those uh, view the first one put the, the the ruling party to 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 be leading but the last one i saw uh, from uh, 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 afro Af i saw the last last one is giving a very uh, percentage of leading by opposition party but from what we are seeing from the the the, 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 the street interacting with the young people, many young people are very disappointed. Uh, many young people want even to emigrate to, to go to another uh, country because they see there's no hope in this country. Uh, this highly politicization of, uh, of public life, even to get a house, you have to have uh, a membership in the ruling party. It's not easy to get a house. So the housing, the, there was a project for uh, building a, a house for, for youth and so on. But those who are, have, have access, you have to be a member of, of the ruling party. You have to, pro to prove that you belong to this party to get the housing. Education is another thing, and unemployment. So young people, they are hopeless. And given that the Angola, uh, the majority of Angolan people are young, so that uh, clearly give a, 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 a lead to the ruling party, because uh, uh, less young people will vote for the, the uh, give the lead to the opposition party, because less young people will vote for the ruling party. So that give a chance to the opposition party. Uh, uh, Unita and uh, and Adalberto Costa Juno to to win this election, but the issues is about those um, uh, uh, question of uh, dead people, uh, deceased, uh, deceased people in uh, in uh, in uh, electoral list. We are talking about fourteen million as registered, but uh, the last interview of Adalberto Costa Costa Juno to the CNN, he mentioned there are 3 million of deceased people in that list. So that's the, 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 the question we need to answer. Is that is going to influence? Because in that case, we are talking about 11 real people in, in the electoral list, and the rest, they are fake and, and, and so on. So the main issues is not about voting. The main issues is how the, the, the result will be monitored, how this election will reflect the reality of the voting. That's the main question. But uh, if the election are, are free and fair, it's, 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 it's likely that the opposition is going to take this election. All right. Uh, let's take a look at um, the impact that uh, the later uh, Savimbi, uh, Jonas Savimbi, of course, you know, the founder of uh, the UNITA party, uh, being a, a political revolutionary and, of course, a, a rebel, 
uh, do you think his um, impact on um, uh, Costa Junior will actually um, see Costa Junior prove a point, especially at this election? I'm going to go straight to you first off. Let me talk to Claudio on this one. Um, are we going to see any impact on, of course, uh, Jonas on Silva? Uh, for the majority of, of Angolans voting today, uh, Jonas Havindi is a guy you see on YouTube videos. Uh, he, he passed away 20 years ago. Um, he's a completely different politician than Adalberto Costa Jr. Costa Jr. does not mention him really on, on political speeches and on his rallies. And it doesn't look like uh, Savindi would have informed the mind of a current politician in the, in the 21st century. Obviously, Savindi was larger than life here in Angola. He had a huge impact on international politics and he had a huge impact on, on, on his followers. But Savindi is not, it, his name doesn't really come up anymore. And it's, it, it's interesting because these are, these are the first elections that we have in which both Jonas Savindi and Jose Eduardo dos Santos are both seats. And this is a, a huge moment in our country because it means that we can finally move on from these two people that completely polarized uh, our country since, the, uh, since, since our independence. It's refreshing that neither of them uh, are, are, are part of the current discourse. Even though Dos Santos, for example, is recently deceased, he also has very little impact or influence in, in the current generation and, and, and the way that we're going to vote. Um, he, Dos Santos Arvindo really is part of history, uh, and, and his name is not really invoked uh, publicly by Unita's leadership at this point in time. When it was, however, recently, or not, not, not that recently, but a few years ago when he was finally laid to rest in his ancestral home, there was a flurry of, of, of attention paid to his legacy, which is very mixed. But today, it's not really a topic for discussion. All right. Thank you so much, Claudio, for that. We really appreciate you, Francisco and Claudio, for giving us insight into this election that, that is ongoing today, the 24th of August. Uh, thank you so much once again. Thank you for having us. Thank All right. We're still discussing Angola's election. We'll go on a short break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.